Is there a single number that will tell you whether the stock market as a whole is overvalued or undervalued, and therefore whether it's a good time to buy or sell? Uh, and is there a number that will tell you whether individual sectors and companies are over or undervalued, and whether you should buy or sell them? Well, many investors would love to find it, and for fans, Tobin's Q could be such a number. Well, that's a rather exotic sounding name, and basically, not surprisingly, it's named after the person who came up with it. Uh, and this is no a Mickey Mouse number dreamed up by an out-of-work financial bozo. This number was dreamed up by a chap called James Tobin, Nobel Prize winning professor in economics, and worked at Yale for a chunk of his career. So quite a CV. All right. Now, what is Tobin's Q? Well, Tobin had this very, very simple sounding idea that the market value of US listed firms should be, in theory, equal to the replacement cost of all their assets. So the Q ratio looks something like this. What you do is take the market value of has to be US listed firms, because otherwise it's very difficult to get a market value. There needs to be share prices. So the market value, ideally for the full Tobin's Q of equity and debt, so the market value of US listed firms compared to the replacement value of their assets. And Tobin said, well, in theory, and we'll just make up some numbers here, Tobin said, well, in theory, if that's 10, 10 million, 10 million, and that's 10 million or billion, um, that would give you 10 over 10, which is 1. And what Tobin said was that like, long term, if you like, those two should be the same. And after all, why would the market put anything other as a value on US firms than what it would cost you to start them again today? All right, their replacement value, what they're worth. Okay, well, that's a nice theory, but how can it be used? Well, here's the reality, okay? You can see that as the top number drops, the ratio is going to dip below one. So, for example, if I make that 5, mathematically, the ratio is going to drop to 0 0.5, 5 over 10. And equally, if the market value of US firms, picking arbitrary numbers here, was 20 billion, trillion, doesn't really matter, 20 over 10 would give you a Tobin Q of 2. So you can see it fluctuates depending on what's happening to the market value of the firms in the equation and the replacement value of their assets. All right? And that's, in fact, what's happened historically. For the US stock market over around 120 years, the Q ratio has dipped as low as 0.3. It's back in the late 1940s. And it surged up to as high as 3. All right? So this has been three times that. Um, and that was right before the dot-com crash. All right, so quite a range. So, as an investor, what do you read into a fluctuating Q ratio? Given that long term it should tend back towards one, it's the natural order of things, what do you conclude from the fact it can be below one or above one? Okay, so let's have a think about that. In my first example there, if the market value of firms is below the replacement value of their assets, that's all of them intangible, tangible, and so on, um, then what are we going to conclude? Okay, well, a pessimist would say that where the Q ratio dips, all right, now think about it, if the Q ratio is dipping, essentially shareholders, the people who buy and sell shares, are putting a low value on firms relative to the replacement value of their assets. Some people would say, well, that means, pessimists would say, these are too high. That's why the Q ratio is dipping. All right? So pessimists, and it can be associated with sort of a pessimistic market when the Q ratio dips, if you like, would say, well, what needs to happen is these need to come down. Okay? How are asset values going to come down? Firms are going to go bust, they're going to get liquidated, assets are going to be written down, and eventually that will correct things. All right? It'll pull the ratio back towards equilibrium or one. All right? But some people would say, not so fast. I mean, yes, OK, there might be a few liquidations. Yes, there might be a massive write-down, but surely when the Q ratio is slipping further and further below one, we're heading to a point where there are bargains to be had. Suddenly, 
we're saying, well, firms are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper by their stock market listing relative to what they're in theory actually worth. And that will encourage mergers and acquisitions. It'll encourage firms to buy each other up because it's cheaper to buy a rival than to actually set up and buy the equipment required to be that rival, if you like. And that's when the market will be bottoming out. Okay, so there are people who say, to sum up what I just said there, when the Q ratio dips substantially, substantially below one, yes, it can be a sign perhaps uh, of an economy somewhat in trouble, share prices dipping, but when you get down to, to sort of point 0.4, some people say you're getting to a point where actually maybe the market's about to turn back up again, or you'll start to get some of this m and activity, you'll start to get the sort of activity that drives share prices upwards, okay, pulling the Q ratio back towards its long-term average of one, all right? So, buy when the Q ratio is low, say the fans. And equally, if the Q ratio is surging, so for example, you know, share prices are rocketing, all right, relative to the replacement value of the assets these firms actually carry. So the, basically the Q ratio has been dragged above one, and it's been as high as two or three in the past. Okay? There are some um, who would say, well, what that's indicative of you know, is you're going to get basically a situation where you know, firms can see that as soon as they invest in assets, they're worth more in stock market terms than you paid almost. So you're going to get firms heavily investing, existing firms, you're going to get new firms piling into the market. Okay, you're going to have an optimistic scenario where share prices are driven higher and higher and higher on the back of more and more investment. But Tobin Q fans would say, well, that's when you need to watch out because that's a frothy market. Okay, if firms Remember, Q ratio above one. If firms can basically buy kit, and almost turn it around and make money straight away, the stock market's rewarding investment instantly, you're going to get froth, inefficient investment decisions and so on. So when the Q ratio starts to surge, that's when you need to watch out. And the Q ratio has never been higher than it was right before the dot-com crash, where you had share prices way above the replacement value of the underlying assets. All right. So once the Q ratio moves well over one, watch out. Maybe the market is about to turn the other way. Okay, now, does this work for single firms? Can you apply the same technique to just one company? Because I've been talking about the market as a whole. And the answer is, in theory, you can. You can say, for a single firm, when its share price is below the replacement value of its assets, it's kind of undervalued. It's trading at a discount. The market's got it wrong, if you like. It's cheap. And in theory, the reverse is true. When the Q for an individual firm is above one, then you could say, well, the market's putting too high a valuation on the, actual, the underlying assets. The market's getting carried away with itself. So you'd be looking to sell. Okay? However, um, there are some problems with the Q ratio used on single companies. All right? And one of them is where do you get the data from? All right? um, the market value of a firm or of the market as a whole, you can look up. There are listed company share prices after all. all right? But replacement value of assets, Okay, there is national data available. All right, you can look at the Fed's flow of funds quarterly data, and that's something that Andrew Smithers does in some detail. For more information about that, see the website smithers, s m i t h e r s dot co dot uk. That data is available nationally, and that's how um, you know these Tobin's cues for the U.S. economy are, are are spewed out, if you like. But for single companies, it's tougher. I mean, what is the replacement value of Coca-Cola? Well, what do you do about its brand name, its intangible assets? It's not impossible to come up with a replacement value, but it's quite tough. All right. So you will find people who think that Tobin's skew can be applied to single companies to make a buy or sell decision, but there are one or two pitfalls. Okay. The main one being getting hold of anything like meaningful replacement value of asset data, particularly for firms that carry a lot of intangible assets. Those are the ones that have a lot of value, but you can't actually kick them, like brand names, goodwill. Okay, so what would you use instead for single companies? Well, it's not as good, but there is a ratio called the price to book ratio, which I cover in some detail in another video. All right, that compares the market value of a firm to the book value of its assets. Now, the problem with doing book value of assets is compared to using replacement value, which is up to date, it takes no account of inflation. All right, so it's not arguably quite a sturdier ratio, but nonetheless, the price to book ratio is a sort of proxy, if you like, for Tobin's Q when you're looking at companies or one by one. All right. So in summary, Tobin's Q, best used uh, for the stock market as a whole. 
it's a long-term gauge of value, all right? And in a nutshell, when Tobin's Q drops well below one, you may well be close to or at the bottom of the market, looking for a turning point. When Tobin's Q surges over one, okay, biggest example being just before the dot-com crash, you are looking at a situation where maybe share prices have got ahead of themselves and that's when a correction the other way is potentially due.